I move that the uh, minutes be confirmed. Yep. <laughs> Happy to second. The agenda report. Sorry, the notes of the implementation of the agreed audit actions will be mounted and reported to the audit and risk committee on a quarterly basis. So, the um, internal report and the update report. Who would like to introduce this item? Yeah, yeah. I would chair. Thank you. Um, so, Eric Beer from KPMG. I've also got Nabia here through led the field work with us, but um, happy to take the committee with some through some overarching comments around the report, and then we can hand to Navi to go through a couple of the findings. But um, essentially, overall, a, a positive report. Um, you can see on page four of our report um, that there are a number of positive findings in terms of the clarity of roles and responsibilities around the internal financial control review program. Uh, we noticed that staff were quite knowledgeable and aware of the importance of the internal controls and how the program worked. Um, a really positive development in recent times, transitioning from an Excel spreadsheet-based approach of monitoring it through to the Reliance system, because um, we do know that it was a pretty manually intensive process going um, previously. And with that's come along some training on how to use the tool as well. We did conduct um, some sample testing as well, and pleased to note that there were no inconsistencies or exceptions noted through that. And then finally, another, another positive really for the report was um, a small benchmarking exercise we did with two other similar sized councils in South Australia. Um, you can see that in section 2.6 of the report. Um, but on that note, I'm, I'll get Navi to just give a couple of highlights of that benchmark and go through the two risk rated findings and then more than happy to open up to any questions that the committee might have. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, in terms of what Eric was actually stating on in 2.6 of the report, we compared uh, the city of Alcoperga against two other similar councils in sizing. Uh, we've highlighted some of the key areas, but I think the, the major call out was in terms of the reporting area where the city of Alcoperga has a very good reporting process in terms of the outcomes of the testing review. Whereas some of the other councils, it's more of a exercise they do with no reporting flowing upwards in terms of how the controls are actually functioning. When we look at the overall report though, uh, as you can see on page eight of the report, we identified one moderate risk find finding, one low risk finding uh, performance improvement opportunity that the council can look at implementing. In terms of the actual the moderate risk activity, uh, it, was on the lines of continuous review of the key risks not being conducted since the actual implementation. What we're stating here is that in 2018, there was an exercise performed where there was an identification of 300 key controls. Uh, of this, 131 were agreed to be monitored on an ongoing basis. Uh, we, we do agree that the 131 are being rigorously reviewed on an annual basis and recorded up and findings there in a closed on an ongoing process. But what we suggested is in light of the time period that's lapsed, there needs to be a re-review of whether those 131 are in line with the actual conditions of the council and whether could, there could be further tightening of the governance structure with the addition of additional controls or looking at what controls have moved down to the lower risk category. In terms of finding two, which is on page 11 of the report, it's on a lower risk finding. Uh, how the control, how the self-assessment process or the internal financial control review process works is on an annual basis, the finance team will do self-assessment of the performance of those controls. Uh, they, they would accordingly rate the outcome of those uh, controls. In terms of the controls that were marked at, you can also almost say partially effective or in effect, or, or you can say partially effective. There was no action noted within the actual implementation of what would be done to move that partially effective to an effective state. While we accept that certainly there was reporting on the, the actions taken to actually rectify that shorter gap, 
the finance team and the governance team are looking at the controls that were not really on parts of the effective but more on the ineffective side so there was more highlighting on the actions taken therein uh we're suggesting this is low given that these are these are relatively low risks in terms of the processes reviewed um yeah. so soon yeah. how do you want to handle this do we need to make comments as we go or is there anyone like to think in I think we're at the end. We're at the end now. So <laughs> no, no, no. Navid just finished his last point. So yeah. he was, I think he was just about to say, happy to open. Thank okay. you. Questions or comments? No. Sorry, no. Any questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, talk? No. Yeah. Um, just thanks. Um, with your 3.0, I'm not sure what page it's on because I've just got my comments on the right, but your 3.0 internal audit findings, you, you spoke there of um, delegations of authority are not commensurate with job roles and responsibilities. So I'm just asking whether you're alluding to, I guess that relates to financial delegation. But can you just explain that a little bit? You said delegations of authority are not commensurate with job roles and responsibilities. Can you put some words around that for me, please? Uh, sure. Uh, those are examples of uh, particular risks that are that may not be formally monitored through this internal control review exercise. So what we've highlighted there in our examples of risks that were in the BPM framework that may not be identified because of the 131 controls that you're monitoring. We're not stating that you don't have processes in place to actually ensure that that's not happening. We're just saying that of the 131 controls, this portion, this risk is not really being captured in that annual review process that's being conducted. It's just been revealed to me what the process is here. I'd like to have a longer question on this. Is that um, what Council Young's just done is absolutely correct. We begin with questions, we then move it, and we then second it, and only then are we permitted to debate. Now, yeah. you sure that's true for committee meetings? <laughs> um, Sorry, Boy. questions you can ask. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we can debate, you only get four minutes. So this is a bit like question time in Parliament. If you want to debate something, I strongly suggest you frame it as a question. <laughs> is that my debate, was it? Yeah. That's a question. The question. <laughs> uh, other, which invites, are there any other questions? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm curious, and I'm not sure how to frame this as a question, but I'll think of something. Mm -hmm. We have three hundred controls, in which 131 are monitored. So it makes me wonder what's happened to the rest and why we have controls if they're not monitored, and whether or not why do we need to have a look at the 131 controls to refine them. But in fact, the whole framework, you know, in terms of the entire set, because um, you know what gets measured gets actioned. So I'm just. I don't want there to be some sense of um, assurance around something that's not being monitored, and I'd like to uh, invite um, Eric on if that's possible. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Paula. Um, so, um, essentially, the the thinking behind the the one thirty one is is taking a, a a risk based approach. So it's a good process in our mind to go through and understand the whole environment of the three hundred, but whether or not you need to go and actually perform and prioritize your finite resources to test every single one of those controls sometimes can be you know you need to get the balance right so we we normally do agree that a risk-based approach is is good so we're not saying that those other you know 170 odd controls aren't important but through that sort of periodic review process which is pretty much the gist of recommendation one you take a fresh look at that 300 and you look at the risks around them and maybe from you know every couple of years that 130 might become 180 or get towards 200 wherever it might be but as long as you're always putting that risk based approach um you know we're generally comfortable with that it's not we we don't normally expect every single control in, in every organization to be to be checked unless the risk warrants it 
So as long as that pro that process is in place, we're we're fine. And there are sometimes other parts of assurance that might pick things up. So an internal audit might look at some of those other hundred and seventy odd controls once in a while. So it's not like they won't ever get touched by anyone, and that's part of that assurance map recommendation, which is performance improvement opportunity. But in general, we're we're, we're comfortable with the with the methodology, and it's consistent with what we would see in other organisations. Hopefully, that does that answer your question, Paul. Thank you. I was just wondering, with the self assessment of the control effectiveness, are they, and it may be in here, and apologies if it is. Um, do they do a self-assessment on the whole 131 annually, or was it just uh, matching the ones that you were doing a spot check on? Uh, they do a self-assessment on 131 controls, uh, on, on the performance of those 131 controls, if that's clear. No, I'm sorry for not being able to ask us a question. It appears that um, only three total controls, uh, or three recommendations or findings, is a pretty good outcome. And certainly, uh, couldn't see only one model which staff are going to address in the current financial year, which we look forward to. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'm hoping I'm not getting ahead of things here. Um, on um, the performance improvement opportunities, we talk about the creation of an assurance map. I'm wondering, maybe I'm visualising it incorrectly, but it seems to me that could be quite a substantial exercise. Is the, is the, the greater comfort that we get from that you know, not all the, this, do you think the um, the effort and the reward are in balance there? Okay, yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, we, we do see um, the creation of assurance maps as a as a, bit, a you know a facet of better practice in terms of governance. What it does is provide, especially for governing bodies like a committee, a really holistic view of what your control and assurance landscape looks like. So. Internal audit is only one source of assurance. You have external audit, you have you have other types of assurance. And to actually understand what your critical controls are and then work out for those critical controls, what types of assurance you're actually getting helps to work out if there's any gaps. Because sometimes, because the organization's so big, if you only take it from one assurance provider, there might be a there might be something that slips yeah. through the cracks, but it also equally picks up duplication if you see there's a low-rated risk or a slave rate of control and multiple parties are providing assurance on it, you can best divert your resources to focus on high risk. But it is a quite big undertaking to do it. And there's different types of assurance maps. You can do back of the envelope, high level ones, or you can do really in-depth ones, which can take, you know, at least a year. Mm. You just can see by the, you know, the target date on that one that that's, um, um, you know, probably reflective of the level of effort, but also... They're things that need to be continually kept up to date because they should reflect the way the, the, any changes in the organisation. But in general, they they are they they do take quite a bit of effort altogether, but they do provide quite a bit of benefit. Okay, so the yeah. benefits commensurate with the effort. That's, yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, while I've got the check, can I just ask one other? Well, I've got the microphone. Um, the procedure, as you know, we've um, depreciation is a big issue for this. This, this council. Um, the procedure about um, uh, infrastructure additions identified by the senior fixed asset accountant and verified by the works department, is that is that standard procedure? I, I think what I'm driving at is, is, is given the size of the depreciation expense here is um, and the fact that we, we have to cover it a non-cash item with cash, mostly in the form of rates, it's pretty important that, yeah. that, that this is right. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Look, I, I think the link for, from our perspective on this one is there's the 
core underlying financial processes around how fixed assets are managed. And we're talking about sort of additions and write-offs and the depreciation is really based off the back of making sure that you've got an up-to-date fixed asset register. Mm. So in terms of how the, when are the additions recorded in the right way, are they recorded at the right time? Because then that triggers when depreciation can start or stop. So, um, so it, it, it is important and it is linked. And I think that's, whilst this isn't specifically looking at depreciation in its own right, it does, having good processes around those types of things, fixed assets additions, does provide extra assurance that your depreciation is more likely to be um, an accurate number that you're following. Yeah, on, uh, for, for, man, for budgeting and financial reporting purposes, I think, um, and I'll phrase this as a question, is um, do you think there's a need for some you know, critical mindset to be brought to this decision because, in effect, it's whether you spread the expense out or whether you cop it at the time. And in terms of, um, of, of our budgeting, you probably want to err on the side of the second of those things, I would have thought. Yep, I'd, I'd agree with that, Chair. Are there any other questions? It's your last chance, aren't we? Because you've only got four minutes of debate. <laughs> if, um, if there are no other questions, then I would, um, would someone like to move the um, the the, re the resolutions that are in the um, in the meeting papers? Happy to sign them. Okay. Item seven, thank you. So I don't have to repeat it all. Someone like to second that? Thank you. Yeah, happy to second. Yep. Now, is there any debate? Very good. Yep. We'll move on. No, sorry, all those in favour. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thanks very much. Now, I think we can do the confidential item, do we not? We can. Yeah, we could. We decided that we'd like to just debate it early. You just need to, so you need to just yeah. the gallery. Yeah. Um, for the benefit of all here, I'd like to um, suggest an alteration to the sequence of the agenda and such that we bring forward the confidential. Item to this point of the meeting. Is everyone okay with that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, 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 so it's going to be the focus last for later on the second one. Yeah, okay. Where's that? Where's the top point one? So it's like Yeah, so there, there is a first motion. Yeah. Okay, my attention has been drawn to um, the, the, the first piece of business we need to deal with, and that's the resolve to have this discussion in, in confidence as um, expressed under recommendations part one, two, and just, just part one. Just part one. Yeah. Yep. So, so, move so I need to, someone to move. We won't read it all out. I'm seconded. Seconded. Happy to second. Thank you. All those in favour? Okay. Is that what we need to do on that? <laughs> Proper name. So I think we're up to we're up to seven point three. Seven point two. Yeah, so we are. Well we are. Um right. just bearing in mind the time. What do we need to do here? So the report's been provided 
um, the margin. Is there any discussion? Um, through the chair, um, the there is a draft legislative compliance um, scope attached uh, as attachment four, yep. um, which will give an opportunity for any of the members to provide um, feedback, or if you are happy with the scope, then we can note that in the recommendation. Any discussion? It was just, it, just, just one thing I was going to ask on that. What page is on there? It was, uh, it's been page thirty-four of the report. It was a, a number of outstanding actions with status overdue, and then there's some comment. There was that number was eight, and I might have misread this, so please bear with me. Um, the summary of overdue action items is six six actions that are awaiting one council implementation improvements or technology one assistance. And my question was what what about the other two overdue actions? So that you got eight overdue and there's this commentary about six I just wondering what the other two. Yeah. Certainly. Um through the chair, the other two items that are overdue is um item uh, action 176. Um, which is the um, corporate risk register for community safety, which we are progressing, um, and also 175, which is the Rangers team allocation procedure, which is also progressing. I'll, I'll just take all these documents as, as one for the purposes of questions. Is, is there anything else? Um just in the internal audit charter and plan, um, I was just a bit concerned by the work health and safety. Uh, let me just get your page number. Sorry. Uh, the other audits around work health and safety, uh, so it's page 49. Uh, planning in progress and then in appendix A, the failure to provide a safe work environment is sort of still up um, high uh, residual, uh, sorry, inherent and then a medium residual. Just wanted to, I guess, ask the question around um, where next work health and safety audit is, is likely to occur, given that um, um, it, it's pretty significant. Risk. Um, through the chair, I think uh, the safety of staff in an organisation of this size is always going to be quite a complex risk matter. There are um, audits that happen um, periodically over our work health safety systems, but when that next um, particular large audit which aligns our performance to the um, self-insured standards. When that is due to land, I'd have to take that on notice and send that to you. Any, anything else? Can I just ask, if not, can I just ask quickly about IT risks? Um, uh, it comes up earlier in, in this appendix. Um, sorry, I had it in front of me now. It's, now it's gone away. Well, I guess my query is, is on IT risk is some, um, we should have got our own on this because uh, these, these are tough risks. And, um, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking about protection of data and, um, and, and, Oh, oh yeah, the comment was about IT emergencies, um, and or does the local government sector look after us here? Um, how does it work? Uh, that's an interesting um, question. Um, 
So um, the local government sector does provide some advice and oversight and insurance for cyber security matters. Um, I guess each council has their own um, system, so it would be difficult um, to have um, some sort of overarching program. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we, I guess our program that we're running at the moment um, through our new systems of IT um, will be driving those risk mitigations to a smaller degree. But I don't think there's a holistic overall program um, that the LGA provides. So, yeah, we are pretty much. So do we rely on internal people or external contractors? Um, we have a, a large internal staff, um, but then if we are carrying out testing or um, uh, audits, then we will engage with external staff as well, external companies who have that expertise. Yeah, okay. okay, thank you. Any other questions? Well, I guess it was probably just to follow up on that one um, around cyber security. But I think the mayor's had some cybersecurity attacks. Do we have we increased their audits in in response to that? Or? Um, through the chair, the mayor's um, social media platforms stood outside of our um, the platforms that the organisation looks after. Okay. Now, if there's no other comment, I think we've been asked to note this report. Um, someone like to move that the report be noted. Happy to see. Um, seconded. Thank you. Thank you. Who's All those in favour? Tim, who's mm -hmm. uh, Andrew. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so that, according to my agenda, brings us to 7.3, the Paul Murray Recreation Centre Redevelopment, the um, Prudential Report. Um, now, we'll, I'll take it that everyone's had a chance to have a look at it. Um, just let me get up to where we are. Okay, um, so we're being asked to receive and consider this report. Um, does anybody want to speak to them or anything? If it's brief, I don't need to do under the hands of my committee members. I've, I've got a couple of questions on this, but. Okay. Thank you. So, look, this is a pretty exciting project, um, the Paul Murray Recreation Centre Redevelopment. So, Hub Gymnastics is one of our largest sporting clubs in our region. They've got a, about a 680 participants, 350 um, waiting lists. So, um, they've been advocating for a long time for upgrades to their facility. Um, for them, this is a pretty hard for upgrade. They've managed to secure funding and working with council, securing funding of about $5.45 million. So, from state, federal, um, and local government through City of Onkapringa. Um, the project currently has an estimate of about 5.8 million. So we have a budget shortfall um, we've identified on estimates, um, but we are keen to proceed to tender for the project or have commenced a tender process um, to test that and have a real firm figure from the market to be able to base um, future decisions on um, how we might address a shortfall if there is in fact a shortfall. Um, the value of the project has us um, requiring a prudential report under the Local Government Act. We've had uh, independent consultants, uh, UHY, Haynes Norton, prepare that. Um, and from our perspective, the findings and the comments within that um, prudential report are pretty straightforward, nothing of concern um, there from our point of view. So we're uh, very confident proceeding with the project from administration point of view, but obviously presenting that here today and then also to our council um, next Tuesday night. Thank you, Andrew. Just a question. I uh, also missed that there wasn't anything hidden about the UCs, um, I suppose, ability to pay or willingness to pay additional legal costs and their financial position. Yeah, sure. Um, the 
uh, lessee has actually been paying a, a significantly higher lease cost than um, the, the process of moving from a, a more commercial arrangement into a more community-based arrangement. So they have had the capacity to pay a higher rate for an extended period of time. Um, the changes to their lease arrangements means they'll be paying less um, as a starting point. So the investment in the facility and any increase in costs associated with that, um, we believe they have the capacity to fund because they've demonstrated that over years in the past. That's right. I just ask that because my experience at uh, across multiple councils, you do get some organisations, community organisations who resent paying. Uh, so making sure that you know build it and then not have a tenant that's able to meet the obligations. Thank you. My query might be one for Jade more than, but it seems to me when I look at. The increase in operating costs of getting up to what is one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, almost all of it's depreciation. So that when we get grants from federal and state government, that's fine for meeting the cash costs of constructing, but that the way we recover our depreciation expense in council, even though it's a non-cash expense, we've got to recover it in cash in the form of higher rates, and it concerns me. Well, let me put it more gently. I presume the council is fully cognizant of this when it makes these, these decisions as to whether to accept these grants or not. So through the chair, that information certainly um, has been coming to council to discuss not just the increased operating costs through depreciation, but any additional maintenance costs. And I note that the report does mention that the majority of the operating uh, cost increase is in depreciation, and that will be reflected in um, the rates or the operating position that we have for our future budgets. Um, so as part of our long-term financial plan review, we're making sure that that is captured and communicated through reports to elected members when we are presented with opportunities to take advantage of um, you know, grant funding. To, essentially, there's no free check. Um, there's going to be an increased cost, but we need to make sure we're capturing that and we're cognizant of that in our decision making. This is totally unfair, but I'll do it anyway. Is, can you tell me if council gets given, say, $10, $50 million from the federal government towards the cash costs of, a, of an asset that falls within council's control, Let's just say that the asset lasts 20 years. What impact would that have on rates? I told you it was unfair. <laughs> I'm not going to try and do calculations off the top of my head, but we would certainly be looking at what that depreciation is. So the $50 million, did you say? So yeah. $50 million yeah, just for over, over 20 years. So if that is, you know, $1.5 million each year, mm -hmm. or $2.5 you know, $2 million each year, sorry. I can't do maths on the fly. Uh, so $2.5 million each year in depreciation that would be recovered through rates. But certainly from a, uh, I guess, an asset point of view, um, if it was you know, a building asset, for example, it would have a much longer useful life than 20 years. Not many of our assets yeah, would sure. have a 20-year useful life. Yeah, no, that's, that, that's a good point. But I assume that we, you know, because there's, when these funds are received, there's a grant agreement. And I assume that there's other levels of government have no interest in helping out with the ongoing expense beyond providing the, the cash grant. Yeah? Uh, yes, that would be a fair assumption to make. Right. Um, yeah. No, I'd, I'd, I'd just be keen to make sure that council's fully aware of these things because it looks great when they come along with the money. Um, yeah. Um, and, yeah, and, yeah, the other comment I have, I noticed you said you're working with uh, users to identify alternative locations during build. Is, uh, is that... Is there an option, um, options available there? Because otherwise, obviously, that's a cost or a potential uh, issue for the council. Uh, yeah, so we've been working um, very actively on that front. Um, uh, I guess on a few um, options, we've been looking at um, vacant spaces that we may be able to relocate the club to. Um, the nature of the group um, and its quite specific needs in its activities is challenging. It takes up a lot of room and it um, has a tendency to um, put all their equipment out and it's hard to pack up and move away. So um, it is quite difficult, but we've had a number of leads and unfortunately haven't been able to um, secure that um, space to this point. 
Um, we also have facilities of our own that we are looking at as well and the potential to use those. However, that would potentially displace other groups. So we're weighing up pros and cons around that. And then um, we are as a third and perhaps final resort um, through our tender process, we'll be asking builders on the option of a stage development that would allow them to continue to operate from within that facility. That would be more inefficient, would have a higher cost and have a lot of risk in that because inherently doing building works in a functioning space is not ideal. Um, but I guess that just demonstrates to us the exhaustive nature of the fronts that we're pursuing um, at the moment as options to make sure we get the build done, knowing that this group will continue to operate and it services a lot of kids from the south as well. That was, that was partly the purpose behind my questioning that having built a gymnasium in the last five years myself, um, you know, by the time you got pits and you say with high, enough higher access, et cetera, mats out and the uh, reluctance to pack up, that it is fairly specialised equipment, it's not like an oval, et cetera. Otherwise, I, I think the only other risk is obviously the, you won't know until you get the contract contract back and the tenders back to work out whether there is given the current price fluctuations a big bigger gap to fill yeah thanks matt in in the report that million dollars from the federal government you notice haven't hasn't been received yet so what's what's the risk then to council from the what action do we take in relation to the commencement of this process or knowing that we haven't got that money secured yeah, um, it's difficult to comment on because it's an active discussion at the moment, but we're very confident of securing that prior to the commencement of construction. So we're looking at something like a three-month window now from start of tender to award of contract um, early um, next year commencement of works, and we're very confident that, that the million dollars from the federal government will be secured in that time frame. So, yeah. So to add to that, would we start the build without having that? In our pocket? No, we're, we're confident we will have that in our pocket before starting the build. We would not contract um, a builder to do that without the, the money secured because um, council's contribution is also conditional on the federal funding. So the council resolution um, prescribes that we are required that $1 million from the federal government prior to council's um, contribution as well, but we are confident that will be secured. So when you say you wouldn't start the build without it, what what you mean is you won't sign a contract? That's correct. Yeah, okay. I think we've been asked to move this paper. Um, so I'm happy to move that we move the paper. Yeah, I'm happy to move that way. I think the potential report covers off on most of the issues that council should be aware of. Yeah, second. second. Yep. All those in favour? Thanks very much. Um, agenda item 7.4 is the long-term financial plan review. So once again, we're being asked to note the agenda report and current process being undertaken to review the long-term financial plan. Greg, did you want to say anything? I'm happy to take it as read. Okay, Joe's happy to take it as read. So I'll throw it open for questions. Can I just ask about the de debt ceiling, Jay? Sure. This, the, the paper says that this describes that as a principle. Uh, so through the chair, in our previous long-term financial plan, there was a principle that specified a hard uh, dollar value debt ceiling, which is set at $138.5 million. Um, as part of this review, we are reviewing all of the principles. So how does that work if you want to borrow more money? It takes you above that ceiling. Even if it's a dollar, you've got to go back to council. That's correct. Right. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions, comments? If not, would someone, uh, we've been asked to, um, to note it. Would somebody move, like to move, let me note the report? No, second you. All those in favour? Microphones, we don't, we don't have it. Oh, um, there was, um, <laughs> I'm trying to get the order right here. I think it was Paula first, then John. Huh? That'll do, that'll do. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, sorry, if you if if you are good enough to to propose or second, if you could just um, use the microphone to help 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 the Desmond out here. Um, Seven point five, the quarterly financial update, including budget review number four. Um, um, once again, we're being asked to note this and the carry forwards report. Um, comments, questions. No, sorry, questions. Can't do comments yet. How big a variance are you expecting depreciation or revaluation to take? I think mean, you've mentioned somewhere that it's still to be done. So through the chair, um, we've just about completed our year-end financials, which will be coming to this committee next month. Um, but our revaluation um, of the road assets or the uh, useful life review of the road assets re re resulted in a $1.4 million reduction in depreciation on an annual basis. Question if I can. Underspends, um, are they getting bigger or smaller as each year? And and what what is the the pro procedure? So if Department X underspends, does Department X get to keep that money? <laughs> So through the chair, from an operating position point of view, uh, we certainly encourage areas to hand up any savings and underspends that they have. And part of the, um, I guess, the increasing uh, financial education that we're rolling out across the business and with our budget holders is that if they do have surplus funds, if they do have underspends, they need to hand that back. If they have a reason to need to use that, that needs to come as a collective organisational decision. Yeah, good. Good. Um... Any other questions? So you've got two major projects that have been carried forward, Wheeling Street and Witten Bluff Base, something, um, that have been carried forward due to significant delays right, relating to external approval processes. What, what does that mean? Uh, so the Witten Bluff Base Trail um, was subject of a um, uh, required a Section 23 authorization under Aboriginal Heritage Act. So right. it was um, potentially um, interfering with an Aboriginal site, and that yeah. required a statutory process for us to follow through. And that, in the end, took us um, over two years to achieve that approval to allow us to proceed with the project. Um, Waring Street was in a, a similar vein. Um, it, involved um, the transfer of land from the state government um, that was protracted and delayed um, by state government processes effectively to simplify that um, they wanted to provide us with the funding to acquire the land off of them which involved a fair bit of administrative administrative work on their part um, as well so so both of those were caught up in state government processes that took far longer than envisaged yeah, I, I, I guess my query is how much I'm familiar with these sorts of delays. Mm -hmm. Is how much you actually build into it, particularly when it comes to financial planning, yes. because um, the sort of semi foreseeable, aren't they? Yeah, so we were advised in the case of Witten Bluff Base Trail that it would be a six month approval process. So okay. we received that advice from the department that yeah. turned into a two year yeah. delay. So okay, so they'll they'll make a contribution to assisting with working capital. And um, they've offered us half of the shortfall <laughs> for interest rate. <laughs> uh, right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, anything else? Um, okay. So we're being asked once again to note it. Would somebody care to move that the report be noted? Happy to do so. Yeah. Thanks. Seconded. Happy to second, Andrew. Chair. Sure. Okay. Um, that's noted. Thank you. Um, which brings us to 7.5, quarterly financial update, including budget review number four. Joe, maybe you could just 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Someone Absolutely. could just give us a, a brief introduction to this. Yeah, just... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Fixed assets policy. I beg your pardon. I've been looking forward to this. Um, so, did you want to introduce it to me? Sure. So, through the chair, um, there was some, uh, a considerable amount of discussion at the last ARC meeting around our capitalization policy, assets, depreciation, um, and it was requested that we provide a report back to this committee um, outlining essentially what our policy was on those areas. Uh, so, in front of you is our is a, a summary of our um, of our policy. In the attachments includes the entire policy, our useful lives, and the workflow for how we determine what is operating versus capital expenditure. Questions? No, an observation for another audit release. Um, there's been some discussion of whether library books should be capitalised and on accounts as to, and it relates back to whether councils actually have control of the library books given the one system that. They can be anywhere from any from mobile and from anywhere, and therefore does control still best with council. Um, um, yeah, that's a, that's I remember that in a recent committee myself. It's become a live issue, it seems. It might be something you might want to consider. I think an internal order to pick it up, but when council and the council did a bit of research and. I've recently put a paper up in relation to that. So, but that's no different from the recreation centre then, because state government provides money for purchase of library books, so they have to be capitalised. Well, then that's another expense that's got to be recovered through higher rates. Uh, it's more based on the the issue that the uh, book could be borrowed from anyone from anywhere in the state and. Take off the shelves and go elsewhere, so you don't actually have any control over the physical asset. Just to appreciate very quickly, I think they should be candidates for being expensed. And that's what most councils are now doing rather than having them capitalised. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I guess I've, I've got a couple. Um, the 2023, this year's review of the useful lives methodology applied to the road network, does, did that result in the life getting longer or shorter? Uh, through the chair, what that resulted in financially was a decrease in the depreciation expense for certain road types, depending on the um, treatment type and material, et cetera. So the life got longer? Yeah. 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 yeah so not. Not holistically, like certain road types, depending on material type, et cetera, extended. Yeah. Um, others reduced, but the overall impact was a $1.5 um, million reduction. And does this actually match the real world experience? I'm, 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 I'm full disclosure. I think roads can often be over engineered. Um, Is that a finance question or engineering? Yes, if they're over engineered, they need to be spread out over a long period of time. No, that's fair. Um, yeah, I think what, what our data suggests is that we're kind of within, you know, reasonable benchmarks of mm -hmm. other councils. It does, yep. But there's a lot of uh, investment in that space at the moment in terms of useful life um, considerations and depreciation impacts, et cetera. Okay. It's ongoing. My other comment was going to be your capitalisation thresholds look fairly low in general. Um, given where the prices are at the moment, you know, a couple of thousand for a lot of things as to whether that clogs up your asset register or not. Yeah, no fair question. Through the chair, uh, I agree with you. Um, certain asset types like open space have a, um, a capitalisation threshold of 2,000, which is super small. That should probably be extended. So there's work happening in that space to look at not only capitalisation thresholds ongoing, but um, useful loss and, and those kinds of things. The, the gifting of assets that's looked at very carefully, I imagine. Yeah. 
Any other questions, comments? I just want to know how often you find new assets. Um, that seemed quite interesting. <laughs> no, through the chair, good question again. Um, it does happen from time to time. Um, like certain audits uncover, in particularly underground assets like water. Um, I guess if there's road projects, et cetera, they might find assets as a result of construction. Um, so it does happen. It's predominantly in the water class. But um, in my time here, it's um, it certainly happened infrequently, um, but predominantly within water. This came up in an earlier part of the meeting and I was after a bit of reassurance that the decision as to whether to capitalise or expense, and, you know, um, how do I say this politely, is made by financial people, you know, and not necessarily by the people who are building the assets. Uh, so through the chair, there's certainly standards that dictate how we need to create yeah. certain assets and whether it can be capitalised or, um, or or an operational expense. Yeah. So we do lean on those frameworks um, very much. Well, yeah. Good. Yep. Anything else? No. Well, once again, we're being asked to note that somebody would like to move. So. Happy to move. Thanks, Paul. Seconded. Thanks, Thanks Andrew. Happy to um, Agenda item 7.7 .7 is the strategic risk review. Um, are there any questions about this review? I guess not a, not a, um, I don't want to make it a question. Um, from an elected member point of view, I think risk 12 is the failure to maintain discipline. Um, it's certainly a live issue, one that we, um, you know, comes up every council meeting, especially around budget positions and trying to hold the line on that. So I guess commentary from the audit risk committee about that risk would, would be well received by the elected member body. Right. Can I just ask a question about the emergency management? Um, I guess the question in my mind is how much of the problem do we own? Um, is, you know, there's other people that are out there that are responsible for emergency management too. And how do we decide which which are the things that we own? Um, through the chair, so we have a an emergency senior emergency management officer that sits in my team. And um, we are very clear, I think, on what council is responsible for and what council is not responsible mm. for. Um, they're, they're Sorry to inter interrupt. Yeah. I'm sure you are clear, but is that agreed with everybody, the other parties? That's that's the, that's the crucial point. Yes, yeah, so and our staff are on various um, emergency management committees um, that interact with our um, state government partners. So I think we're very clear on where our responsibilities lie and where theirs lie. Um, okay. Do you have anything you want? Uh, yeah, there's also uh, legislation in place yeah. um, that states we have to have a, a role in emergencies, and that legislation um, states that we, you know, there's certain activities that we have to undertake um, in in terms of um, preparation and response to emergencies. Um, they we work um, with. All the other emergency groups, the SES, um, SAPOL, we meet with them regularly to discuss um, planning for emergencies and yeah. preparation for emergencies. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So beyond working with the BMOU, is there things in place to um, address the issues that have been raised, I presume? Yeah, yeah, all of those meetings are minuted. Um, yeah. 
Are there any other questions? Um, I don't have a question as such, but I'm curious as to what um, Councillor Pritchard was alluding to exactly. I think I understand, but it would be helpful if that could be um, explored, perhaps. Sure. Um, I guess we go through the annual business plan process and um, we set a budget um, and then the discipline of the chamber is then to stick to that budget is our biggest challenge because you have a notice of motion moved. Um, we've talked about the hub gymnastics tonight. We've really had a notice of motion to request an additional half million dollars for that facility. Um, and so those those notices um, are going to continue to come um, and it's for the elected member body to, to debate them and make a decision, obviously. But um, noting that there is a sort of a bigger picture in play um, around that risk is what I was trying to convey, I guess. What do the... Um, I don't know who this is for, but what do the delegations say about which variations, what size variations and for what have to go to council and what can get decided by management? Uh, through the chair, you're talking about financial delegations? Yeah, well, yeah, mostly, yeah. Yeah. I might hand over to Fu for this one. I think, um, Chair, um, the issue that Councillor uh, Pritchard raises is is probably not the sort of the individual delegations around each offices and how much they can spend. It's really a discipline in the chamber around things that are agreed at a council level. And then if something outside of the budget, for example, pops up during the course of the year, there can be temptations to support that because of community appetite, community support. Um, so it's more of those bigger um, opportunities that come across the desk. And you alluded to a chair earlier around state government, federal government funding, where they might come towards the chamber and offer an opportunity and they run in the plans. And there's always that temptation in local government sometimes to capture those opportunities without understanding those full costs. So um, it's a practice and it's something that the chamber um, I, I see is getting better at uh, over a period of time. Um, but it's always existed in local government uh, around that temptation to try to alleviate from the um, the existing plans already endorsed. So it's um, yeah. ongoing. So what I had in mind specifically is the qualitative distinctions between if a contract for a road overruns, you know that that's a that's a variance. It's got to be funded, and but, you know that's an explainable variance. Someone comes along for what's effectively a grant. And then establish grant procedures that, in effect, they're not only asking for the money, but they're asking to be exempted from the normal competitive procedures. And that, from an audit point of view, that troubles me. I think, um, from a, I guess, frank governance and a risk perspective, um, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong here, but we've got very robust rules, and probably some areas probably think it's too robust. Um, so in the sense that if we're not outside of what's already endorsed by council, then the decision-making and the power of the council rests with the um, decision-making body of the council. So uh, often officers actually have limited authority to operate outside of what's already put in the budget. So if we do have something come across our desk, even if it's small, very often we'll have to go to the chamber and actually seek approval to do that. Would that be a fair comment, Desmond? I think there's also a section in the council report that where they have to explain where they're going to get the money from to meet the request as mm. it's put through. Yeah, what I'm from other areas, I'm familiar with um, different levels of delegation for different purposes. So, an next class, for instance, say government, you probably know it, the next class of payment, no matter how small, has to be approved by the treasurer personally. Yeah. And the reasons for that are obvious. And that's why I'm, I'm you know, I'm a bit like a dog with a bone about grants, because in some ways they're not much different. Yeah. Yep. Uh, 
same, very similar issue was picked up in a recent audit we did of the grants area. Um, grants being approved outside of the usual process. Yeah, I, I can't remember what the what we came back with on that. Um, through the chair, the result of that was that there was a an amendment to the grants policy and procedure um, that was around um, the off the cuff um, quasi um, approaches to council um, through notices of motion, etc. That yeah. um, that there's some rigor put around them, and that they're redirected, if possible, to the grants allocation process. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll just make this comment, not enough, it's worth anything. But it seems to me that too often the, the focus is on the worthiness of the application and too little focus is on the question of why it should be exempted from the normal competitive process. And the, the, I'm familiar with grants made out, outside of processes. I was in the Australia Council for the Arts for some time and things like that. And in every case, you've got to establish why the competitive processes cannot be applied to you. And so I don't, you know, I'm not close enough to know how it works in, in, in council, but I would commend that, that approach to people. Um, with that little harangue, move on. Um, Council Pritchard. I just wanted to um, just ask you in risk eight failure to anticipate and plan for economic fluctuations. From a sort of a real world point of view, how, how did this risk relate to the interest rate rises over the previous couple of years? Um, how would that risk have looked and, and how did we respond in that response? Is that Sorry, my papers hadn't loaded on my iPad, so I was a little bit out of the loop. Um, in terms of responding to things like the interest rate rises and so on, we were um, we were really monitoring um, the impact of those. Um, we were fortunate that in our budgeting, we, um, we hadn't assumed the amount of money we received in advance through our state government funding. So really that acted as a buffer for us. Um, we don't necessarily have that for this financial year. So we are... Um, you know, very mindful of any additional interest rate rises. So for full disclosure, our budget is set at the current interest rate. So any additional increases will impact on our financials into 23, 24. So we're very mindful of that. But in terms of how we responded last year, uh, I guess we did get um, some buffer through that extra money, which meant that our borrowings were a lot lower than what we had budgeted for. But that gets captured in the earlier reports. Correct. We would be seeing that through and it would come through to part through the quarterly financial reports. Yeah, yeah. So. I think, Chief, if I can add to that, um, we've got an annual budget process. We've also got a long-term financial plan which gets updated on an annual basis. Um, it'd probably be naive for us to assume that we're experts in where the economic conditions of the nation are going to go. Um, I don't know that many people probably got the first shadow where interest rates or CPI was going um, or is at the moment. So the best we can do is, in terms of those assumptions moving forward, look at what economic data is available out there from those um, very well, well, well recognised establishments and institutions and we apply those and you know the rba for example inflation and range is somewhere between two and three percent and two and a half percent long term and we tend to use those sorts of figures in our long range planning and the opportunity to revisit that is on an annual basis when circumstances change so it's planning on based on what we know and best information but it's never going to be precise because economics is not always precise in that nature now, if we knew that, we wouldn't be working for living. But, Trey, this, uh, under, um, it gets captured by under 7.5 here, right? The quarterly financial update, I, I imagine. Yep. So, and that captures it, not so much in budget terms, but in, 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 in terms of, of actuals. 
That's correct. We would report that as a variance and we would be showing, particularly when we're when we're um our actuals are over budget, we would be calling that out to say we're monitoring that this is over budget, we recognize this and this is what we're doing about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I can sleep at night now. So um that that is there any further discussion on that item? Just a just a, a um uh, just a bit of a correction there on page 214 it talks about no firm date being set for the referendum which there has been now so I might want to perhaps address that one and I think I was going to ask that failure to anticipate plan and for respond to cyber security threats I might be misreading this but the risk levels is extreme and then you're saying the residual risk is, is medium so I guess what's, what action has been taken to reduce that from extreme, so I'm talking about page two two seven now. So, if you're rating the risk at at, at extreme, what are we doing to mitigate, and what treatment plans you got in place to lower that? Even though the risk is there, I get I get the risk is high, it's extreme. There's a lot of commentary about why it's extreme and what the risks are. But I'm just wondering what commentary might be there to provide some assurance that we're not just saying, well, we know it's that's a problem, but we're not what are we doing? Yeah. Yep. So we've got um two two methods of approach. The first one is um in terms of uh system security. Um I can't go into too much detail because I'm not an IT expert. Um, but it's the system-based approach, so uh, passwords and uh, security measures put on our systems. Um, and the second method we use is um, training our staff and improving our staff's knowledge of cybersecurity. Um, the reason we do that is a large percentage of um, cybersecurity breaches come through um, an action of an individual. Um, in terms of exactly what we do, um, I, I think we'd have to take that on notice and provide you with a response. So, so like my question was more, is it worth putting something in this so you can actually see without going to, into, but even just what you said then would be helpful. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't press my microphone. Um, they, when, when I work with um, the IT department, they what we can share publicly about what we do to prevent cybersecurity uh, breaches um, could give highlights to to potential criminals. So um, I, I will take that on board, and I will in future um, include um, methodologies of what. Yeah, we do. And yeah, but just the point. Even I get the security stuff, but even if what you said before about the, the, the training of staff, I think just have, have some words around that because that's critically important. So no you know, how from who who you're addressing with with that sort of stuff? Is there more focus on? Um, uh, members of the staff that might be more prone to receiving cyber um, or phishing and that sort of stuff. I'm talking, you know, that, okay, usually, you know, directors, um, assistants, those sorts of people normally, they're more prone to receiving those sorts of attacks, whether you're targeting that sort of group. That's That was the sort of stuff I was more yeah. interested in, and, and I'm sure you're doing it. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd encourage that in a confidential item if you're going to put any detail, because once you start going into detail, you're then opening it. I take the point, but yeah. Most other councils deal with this in confidence. Um, so just one last question. And, um, Is this on cyber security? No, council, can I just put in my two pounds worth on cyber security? Two things. First of all, can you give some assurance about the capability of the people doing the training? And I'm, I'm not, it's no adverse reflection on them. It's just it's getting tougher and tougher. And it's, the demands on people's skills are getting harder and harder. And I'd just like to be get a sense of comfort that, that that's been attended to. And the other thing that we know from things like Medibank and Optus is that they were storing information that was either unnecessary or for too long? And do we ever do any systemic look at the kind of information that we require people to provide? 
because lots of people are in love with these things and 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 ask a whole lot of questions that as you know we've also experienced the frustration so what do you need to know that for does is, does that form do we do the form of audit of that or or anything like that um through the chair um just going back to your question about who's doing the training my understanding is that we have a third party okay. provider um, that okay. provides that training, yep. um, who are an expert in that field. Yep. Um, what's the second part of that? The second part is, do we ever do, do we ever look at, are we collecting more information than we need to collect? Mm. Because if we do have an incident and people's information has devolved, the first question is, well, of Optus, they, some information was 10 years old. So, yeah. you know, why did you need to keep that? Yeah, certainly, um, and we've actually got an upcoming internal audit on um, privacy and the governance that sits around that, and we have a privacy statement. Um, we are kicking off at the moment a um, a records management um, okay. rolling program for the next two years, and that's happening in my team. Um, so we, that'll be one of the key things that we address as well, and we also have a process for disposing of records that we no longer need. Great, thank you. Thanks, Richard. Sorry. I was just wondering whether the organisational culture risk um, was reviewed when we got a new CEO. Do, is that something that it should have triggered and, and, and did it? Um, yes, it, it was. Um, basically, um, to complete um, the information in this report, um, I went to um, the HR manager um, and I, he basically wrote that bit for us. So, and I believe that was done um, after um, the CEO's um, KPIs were set. So it was known that um, a cu culture, um, uh, some work on the culture needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Are we there? Would someone like to move the, the, the report be noted? How do you say move? So move. Thank you, Paul. Second move. Thanks, Councillor Pritchard. All right. Uh, all, right all those in favour? How can I forget that? Um, okay. Um, our next agenda item is the Audit Risk Committee Work Plan for 2023-24, I think, yeah. Yes, number seven point eight. Oh, seven point eight. Sorry, yeah. governance fourth quarter. So, any comments on any questions on this? I have a little bit. Um, on the roller skating had a really bad pun in there about being really good, and I just was. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move this along. Um, we've been asked to make the report. Would somebody like to um, say move? Yeah, Andrew, yeah, be happy to move. Second. Councillor Pritchard, thank you. All those in favour? Yep. 7.9 is the Audit Risk Committee work plan for 23-24. Try it open for questions. Knowing that we what's before us here is to approve the work plan included as attachment one. Maybe happy to look in the next plan with the proviso we can add in what we need to or we need to. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you proposing, Andrew? Yep, thank you. Seconded? Sure. Thank you, Paul. Um, all those in favour? Well, I've got the hang of it. Right. Um, 7.10 is the audit risk. Can we, um, the art actions arising from the previous meeting? Uh, for the benefit of the record, I put a view in our earlier meeting that. Um, it's important to keep this report fresh. Um, and there's, there's, 
things that have been done, I don't see any benefit from having them kept on the report. Yeah. And that's only spoken from the perspective of a former state government official who just saw things aggregate and aggregate and aggregate. Yeah. So we're doing something in 2023 because an auditor made an adverse comment in 1968. You know. Um, you know. <laughs> Certainly happy to take that on board. And once we have reported um, the status of uh, matters that have been completed, then they will drop off that report. Well, I'm, I'm putting, putting that for the agreement of the, my five committee members, but that's what I'd like to see. I think it's useful to see, you know, one way of doing it is a shaded item or whatever. Um, it's useful to see that the item has been completed, but it's also useful to see the item that has been completed. So. You know, and then it comes off once we've had the meeting. Um, that's a practice that's um, yeah. Yeah. reasonably common, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's quite helpful. But it, it clearly delineates this is completed, it's done, and it's coming off. This is still in, and I'd like to see something like that if yeah, that's so, possible. So the drill is: it's, yeah. once it's completed, you see it one more time, then vanishes, right? Yep, yep, yep. I just have one question on. Um... Uh, agenda item 7.6 from us. It talks about information will start being provided to us goes in August 2023. Is that have we started providing information? Through the chair, yes, we have. All right. We then someone like to happy to. Uh, thanks, Paul. Seconded. Um, Council Pritchard, thank you. All those in favour. Now I think we come to the best part of the meeting. There's no questions on notice. There's no motions on notice. <laughs> There's no petitions. No urgent business. Right, right. We've dealt with the confidential item, which brings us to agenda item number 13, I believe. Closure. Yeah. Thanks, thanks um, everyone. Thanks particularly to the fellow members of the committee. We feel like, it feels like we've been here for a while. Um, so I appreciate that. I de declare the meeting closed.